Let us go at this moment to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and most merciful God in whom we live, move and have our being, bless this message and this word that it may penetrate the hearts of your people. Search us, O God, know our hearts, Try us and see if there is any destructive way in us. When you find what does not belong, remove it from us so that we may walk the path you have laid for us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. I want to pick up a conversation Every year at Trinity, I take one of Dr. King's messages, a title or a scripture that he has used during King Wink Weekend, and I update or remix that message for what we are dealing with as a nation or as a community. There is a message that has intrigued me for years. It can be found in a book entitled uh, the Measure of a Man, and also in another book entitled A Knock at Midnight. It is a message that Dr. King preached numerous times, whether in a pulpit or in a civic space. The title was, uh, of the message was Three Dimensions of a Complete Life. He pulled from Revelation, the 21st chapter, verse 16, but only used the last few words in the scripture where it says the length, the breadth, and the height. The length, the breadth, and the height. I want to, for this king moment, where we commemorate and celebrate the greatest prophet in American history, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I want us to look at this idea of three dimensions of a complete life in an America that is incomplete. Three dimensions of a complete life in an America that is incomplete. The scripture says the city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000. Its length and breadth and height are equal. If we are ever, uh, if we ever needed to engage the wisdom of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in this nation, it is now. Our democracy is in crisis. This experiment we call America is fragile. We are witnessing assault, an assault upon the very heart of our civic ideals we hold dear. The legacy, I say to you, of Dr. King, I must offer at this hour, is more than a dream. But if you truly want to engage and deal with the ideals that Dr. King professed, will take you down the road of being radical and revolutionary. For he sought to redeem the soul of this nation. It must be noted for those who want to celebrate the sanitized version of Dr. King. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but Dr. King stood for the eradication of poverty the eradication of racism and militarism. He challenged this nation to repent from the idolatry of markets without morals and capital without conscience. Most events across this nation during this time period, uh, this nation will seek to lift up a sanitized version of Dr. King and will give a watered down uh, perspective on the expansive, complex, radical, and politically disturbing vision 
of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Truth be told, if you want to witness a portion of the legacy of Dr. King, I tell you today, I tell you this day, it can be seen in the creative transformative work of a powerful Spelman College graduate by the name of Stacey Abrams, or in the redemptive, uh, morally rooted candidacy of Dr. Raphael G. Warnock and John Ossoff. The root of their work was birthed by the legacy of Dr. King. If you wanna see the work operating in the state of Georgia, check out the New Georgia Project and the organization Fair Fight uh, that seeks to expand the electorate and register more people to participate in democracy. Anyone who talks about voter fraud or creating laws to protect a state from voter fraud, you can be assured they fear the power of black, brown, and young voters who want to create a new America where health care is a right, not a privilege. Private prisons for profit will become antiquated myths cast upon the trash heap of history and clean water, whether in Flint, Ferguson, Mississippi, or Troop County, Georgia, are expectations for all citizens in this republic. This legacy believes that no parent should have to give their child the talk when they encounter the police. This legacy believes if you leave prison, society should not place a scarlet letter upon your back, forcing you uh, to uh, move out of housing and not be able to receive government-backed grants for higher education. King spoke of the social challenges, but also dared us to go on an inward journey. He was a preacher, a connoisseur of the black faith tradition, drawing from the wisdom of Southern ancestors and folkways and organic theologians and the academy. In one of his speeches, he offers a holistic approach to living. He examines that great book, Revelation, dealing with John the Revelator from the viewpoint of a Southern mystic encountering the word and seeking God's knowledge and wisdom. And it is this word that I want to bring up this day and for us to focus, for the word states, the length, the breadth, and the height are equal. John the Revelator speaks apocalyptically with imagery that gives us signposts on how we are to live and how our nation will survive in this moment the length, breadth, and height. That there are three dimensions if you want to have a complete life, according to King. The length of life, according to Dr. King, speaks to our rational self-interest. A person must be concerned with inner development. This development can only come if one has enough love of who they are and whose they are. Now, this idea is difficult because the black psyche and the body is always under assault in this country. And the very essence of who we are is under attack. And many times our bodies are even weaponized by a society that, that does not see us as fully human. But I say to you today, would you make a declaration that I love who I am and I love the person that God has made me to be physically, spiritually, and emotionally. You step on the path of spiritual development for one of the dimensions of a complete life. Here at Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, uh, we, we, we say that we are unashamedly black and unapologetically Christian. Uh, we simply say that our Africanity and our Christianity has no contradiction, that God made us who we are in every person, whatever your ethnicity. You should be proud that God designed you the way that God designed you. As a matter of fact, we even have a song, a theme song, 
Its clothes are uh, unashamedly black, unapologetically beautiful, written a brother by the name of Kavan Carter. I, I witnessed the power of this song and, and the idea uh, that it places within the heart of an individual when I overheard a child in our church singing, I'm unashamedly black and unapologetically beautiful. My heart leapt with joy that this 10 year old had something we should all have. When life attempts to break you, you've got to have a song in your spirit that says to you who you are and whose you are. When you are centered in the fact that I am all right, I am a child of God, there is nothing wrong with me, then you can go on the journey to discover and discern your purpose. You will never discover your purpose if you are ashamed and always apologizing for who you are. Uh, allow me to lean on Dr. King at this moment because King stated, when you discover, we discover who you are. Uh, and you recognize this, all of a sudden you find strength and power. And when you discover who you are, you are able to enter into life with a level of character and dignity that whatever you do, you will do it not just uh, for yourself, but for the glory of God. Dr. King says if it falls on you to sweep streets, sweep streets as Raphael painted pictures, sweep streets like Michelangelo carved marble, sweep streets as Beethoven composed music, sweep streets like Langston Hughes wrote poetry, sweep, sweep those streets the same way Kendrick Lamar spit lyrics. Ah, if you can't be a highway, be a trail. If you can't be a sun, be a star, be whatever you are. If you cannot win, stay in the race. You may fail, but be the best whatever you are. The first aspect is the length of life. And it is amazing when you understand who you are and recognize whose you are, something happens and there is a power that wells up in your spirit. But here in America, it is even a revolutionary idea to simply make the statement that black lives matter. A completely ordinary and obvious statement, black lives matter. But as soon as I say black lives matter. Somebody says all lives matter. But the reason I say black lives matter is because you keep saying all lives matter. I wouldn't say black lives matter if all lives matter, but I have to say black lives matter because you keep saying all lives matter, which means black lives don't matter. So I have to say black lives matter because you don't recognize that black lives matter because you keep saying all lives matter. Though that's why I say black lives matter. When you understand the length of life, that who you are and whose you are, this is the beginning of building a complete life. And that is the first section that Dr. King talks about, that we have to understand the length of life. You have to know who you are. You have to recognize that you are created as a child of God. But he does not stop there. He talks about the breath of life. This is your concern for other people. In other words, uh, your concern for those in the community. Uh, he shares the Good Samaritan story, but I break it down very differently today for you. See, the Good Samaritan story uh, shares a question about community ethics and who is your neighbor. But I mean, must, must break something else down to you that to say the Good Samaritan in itself is a misnomer and is also a bigoted way to communicate the story. The good Samaritan, they put a qualifier in front of Samaritan because people did not like a Samaritan. They said he's a good Samaritan. In other words, to say that most Samaritans, they are not good. He's the good black person. Now he's, she's the good woman. In other words, I have to put a qualifier as if this Samaritan is an exception, but it raises a question about how we are to operate as a village and as a community.
because there is a Levi, someone who is from his community, who looks at someone who has been robbed on the Jericho Road, sees him bleeding, sees him hurting, and decides to move to the other side. Then a priest, a person, a preacher, you would think would go and have compassion for the person who is on the ground, but the priest sees the person and goes on the other side. Because the Levite and the priest are raising a fundamental ethical question. Their ethical question is this, what will happen to me if I help him? Ah, but then there's a Samaritan brother. The Samaritan sees the person bleeding on the side of the road. The Samaritan sees someone who is not from his community, is not the same ethnicity, but does not raise the question, what will happen to me if I help him? He raises the question, uh, what will happen to him if I do not help him? Now, there is a different question that is raised by the Samaritan. I would even break it down further and say it this way, that the Samaritan understands and understands the pain of being left on the side of the road. It is the Samaritan who ends up showing what it means to be a neighbor. And I want you to understand that those who have been marginalized, those who know what it's like to be pushed to the side and discarded in this nation will also be the ones who assist this nation in understanding what community is all about. It is amazing to me that people in Georgia and Alabama and South Carolina, Mississippi and Louisiana who were excluded from democracy are the ones who are transforming those same states and letting people know, though you excluded me, I did not raise the question of what will happen to me. I raised the question, what will happen to us because we are interconnected as a community. This story is about the interconnectedness of humanity. And at some point, we must raise the question, not what happens to me, but what will happen to us in this nation. In America, there are too many people with market ideals, too many people with a capitalistic consciousness that do not have a Christ-centered value system. And many of the people who claim to be Christian are nothing but capitalists wearing Christian clothes. We must raise the question, not what happens to me, but what will happen to us. Because our destiny is intertwined together. That until we figure it out together, we will either rise together or we will perish together. Ah, this is the second portion. This is the idea missing from American policy. We say, what will happen to me? Will I have to pay more taxes? Do you mean I'm a billionaire and I will have to pay another hundred dollars? Will I be able to build whatever business I want to build and infect or pour water that is destructive or chemicals that, that are destructive into the wells of those who are poor? I can't do that. I raise the question about myself instead of a question about the community. We lack compassion and empathy. And we should allow compassion and empathy to guide our decisions. We build community by caring for the homeless. We build community by caring for those who are hungry. We build community by investing in our educational system. We do not build community by saying, I want to take the country back. We do not build community by excluding other people. We do not build community by placing children in cages. We build community through compassion and empathy. We first must have the length of life to know and love who we are, but we must have the breadth of life to raise the question about what it means to create community and have compassion and empathy as a nation. America is in the midst of what could be a midnight or a possible morning. The question for us 
is how will we engage these questions? Will it be about me or will it be about us? Because what happens to you also affects me. And what happens to me also affects you. And until we see that we are interconnected, we will always be a nation in the dark, hoping to find some candle to light our way out of our darkness. The length and the breadth, two dimensions, if we are to create a complete life. Ah, but there is one more. There is the height or the depth. See, the length is in relationship to your understanding of loving yourself on who you are and whose you are. Ah, that breath is the connection to others, the interconnectedness that we must build community. Ah, but Dr. King says that you've got to have some depth, some height, that you've got to know that there is something beyond yourself, something bigger than yourself that there is something bigger than you, something that you cannot define. I know we live in a world right now that uh, does not want to speak in spiritual terms, that we are in a materialistic world that says, if I can't see it, if I cannot touch it, it does not mean anything. But I must break something down to you right now that, that our ancestors, in order for them to move from the pain and the tragedy and blues of the enslaved experience and to have the creativity to be able to build schools and institutions, they believed that there was something bigger than themselves, that there was something working in them and through them. You may not be able to define it in the words of Dr. King in philosophical terms. Men throughout the ages have tried to talk about God. Plato said that God was the art architect uh, of the good. Aristotle called uh, God the unmoved mover. Hegel called God the absolute whole. And then there was a man by the name of Paul Tillich who called God being itself. We don't need to use all these high sounding terms. Maybe we just have to know him and discover God another way. Uh, one day when you, you ought to rise up and say, I know God because I know God is a lily in the valley. God is a bright and morning star. God is a rose of Sharon. God is a battle axe in the time of Babylon. And then when you're able to say that, then you can do the way uh, that our ancestors said it and said, uh, God is my everything. He's been my mother and been my father. God's been my sister and my brother. God's been my friend and a friend to the friendless. This is the God of the universe. And if you believe in God and worship God, something will happen in your life. You will smile when others around you are crying. This is the power of God. I've got to get out of here this morning, but I'm here to let you know that you've got to love yourself. That's the length of life. That's rational self-interest. But you've also got to have the breath of life. You've got to have a community consciousness, a, a village attitude and ethic. But when you finish all of that, you've got the length and the breath. I've got to take my seat, but I've also got to let you know that first and even the greatest commandment is you've got to learn how to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. I think this is the way that psychologists would try to say it, that it shifts your personality when you've got the length, when you have the breath, and when you have the height and the depth. Well, I've got to get out of here. But you see, when you understand this, that will put shouting in your spirit. That will put running in your feet. That will put a wave in your hand. 
When you get all three together, then you will know that the lion will lie down with the lamb. When you get all three of these together, you will look up and find out that every valley will be exalted and every hill will be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh will see it together. When you get all these three things together, you will understand that what I do to you also I'm doing to myself. What I reap, I will also sow. So that when you get these three things together is when you can then say, when you're in trouble and you're going through a storm, you can say, I've seen the lightning flash. I've heard the thunder roll. I've seen the sin breaking dash, trying to conquer my soul. But I heard the voice of Jesus saying, still fight on. He promised me never to leave me, never to leave me alone, never to leave me alone. I'm here to let you know there are three dimensions to a complete life. You've got to have the length. You've got to be unashamed and unapologetic. You've got to have the breath. You've got to understand that we live in a village and what happens to you also happens to me. But you've got to have some depth that there's something bigger than you. There's something greater than you. It's not about you, but God has placed something inside of you. And this nation must learn that there are three dimensions to a complete life. We've got to learn learn how to love ourselves, love our neighbors, but also learn how to love our God. And if we're going to turn this thing around, we've got to understand that God made us beautiful the way we are and that every child who is birthed into this world, every child who is born uh, has the stamp of the divine upon them, whether they are from Guatemala or Haiti or whether they are from France or from South Africa. Africa, every child has the stamp of the divine upon them. When we recognize this, then as a nation, we can transform the challenges in this world and create something new. I bid you good day. May the Lord bless you real good. But I want you to know, build a complete life, the length and the breadth and also the height and the depth so that you may live a a life that will leave a legacy for a generation that is yet to be born. May God bless you. May God keep you. That you may build the length, the breadth, the height, and the depth to love yourself, but also build a village ethic to understand that there is a community, that we are all interconnected, and that there is something bigger, greater than yourself in this world. May God keep you and walk with you during these days. We thank God for you, uh, that you made the decision to be with us on today. And if this message spoke to you, we invite you at this moment to simply send an email or to call and to let us know uh, that you'd like to become a part of this village, this village we call Trinity United Church of Christ. Uh, there's no other village like this village here at Trinity. And so there is a number and an email that has come up on the screen just for you. And we invite you uh, to send us a note and say you want to be a part of this family. You want to accept Christ as your savior. And so I leave you with this simple blessing on this day. May you live a life that has the length, that has the breadth, that has the height, that has the depth so that you may have a complete life, a life where you are glorifying God in all that you do. May the road rise to meet you 
May the wind always be at your back. May the sunlight of Jesus Christ always grace your cheek. And may rain gently fall upon your field. And may God keep you in the hollow of God's hand. Until we meet again, go in peace and live a complete life. See you next week. Peace. In case you haven't noticed, the black church is not perfect. At the end of the day, the church is led by and populated by imperfect people seeking to model the perfection of Jesus Christ. Please join Pastor Moss and the family of Trinity United Church of Christ Sunday, January 24th, as he presents a powerful sermon entitled, I Still Believe in the Black Church. Preaching from Acts 19, verses 1 through 7, Pastor Moss will share a wonderful message of hope and encouragement as he dissects the challenges and the opportunity that lives in the Black Church. We look forward to worshiping with you on January 24th at any of our three virtual services at 7.30 a.m., 11 o'clock a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. See you then.